I was looking uh, through the, the schedule a few days ago and looking at the talk descriptions, and I'll be honest, I had a feeling that Ryan might have written this talk just for me. Uh, it felt like the abstract of this, uh, how can I frame this? Um, if, if I was looking through a dating app and I saw this, this would, be, this would, this would have me straight away. Uh, I don't think that's what he was going for. Just, it, it wasn't just your photo, no, it was, it was all of the aspects of the abstract. This is, this is right in the sweet spot for me. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll maybe expand on why, because otherwise that's, that's weird. Um, uh, but, uh, but first of all, a little, about, a little bit about Ryan. I, I first met Ryan uh, over in Leeds at a, a, an event over, over there, and I was instantly uh, kind of delighted by the kind of things he was saying. He's uh, run an agency for a long time, has, has uh, been in web development for a long time, uh, has been uh, a CTO for, for for, for many years, uh, right now he's uh, getting all kinds of nuggets of wisdom about you know that he's learned from being a CTO out onto Instagram. So who who knew there was a crossover between CTO and influencer? So that's a, that's a that's a new one on me. Uh, but I've been harvesting that content uh, eagerly. It's really really good stuff. Um, Ryan talks a lot about uh, a judicious kind of application of powerful tools. You know, we've got lots of powerful tools, as we've just seen in the last talk, um, and knowing when to use them and how to use them and how, you know, not to be kind of uh, weighed down by some of the things that they can bring uh, as well is really important And thinking about how we can use the, the web uh, platform and the APIs that exist there. Um, just lots of stuff that I'm very, very uh, interested in and excited by. So um, a wonderful title as well, The Unbearable Weight of Massive JavaScript. Oh, I don't know where this could go. Uh, shall we see? Ryan, are you good? You ready? Yeah, Plugged in? Ready. Happy? Thumbs up all around. Okay. A giant, loud round of applause, please. It's Ryan Tunnelsend. Thank you. <laughs> so I brought a couple of things today that I don't think you're going to be overly happy about. It's not a hatred of React, but one is the terrible British weather. You know, usually we come to Amsterdam to, to get out of that. Um, and the second thing is I've got a really bad cold. So I apologize if I sound really nasally. I was hoping to be on, you know, a bit of recovery and sound more like Liam Neeson with a raspy voice, but I might actually sound like a teenager, teenager whose voice is just breaking. Anyway, the show must go on. So despite all of our best intentions, you know, we're all here to improve our performance. We're amassing a larger and larger volume of JavaScript every year that passes. Um, on the last data from the Web Almanac, which was a couple of years ago now, um, it was growing about 10% a year, and I've no reason to believe that it's any different now. And this is at the detriment, obviously, to our end users in terms of performance, but also to us as developers. And with IMP on its way, JavaScript really is the very literal elephant in the room at this point. Um, you know, there's an element of uh, CSS recalc in IMP, um, but ultimately we wouldn't be getting such low pass rates uh, purely if it was just purely down to our C uh, CSS. So today I'm going to talk about our priorities. How did we get them kind of misaligned from our end users? I'm going to be talking about what does it really mean for us to be actually productive? Um, and I'm going to be showing you some things with the web, pla web platform that can help us improve our web performance, can give our users a better experience, and ultimately everyone wins through uh, better productivity. So it's my goal to convince you that you should be looking to the web platform first for features to implement rather than re-implementing everything in JavaScript straight away. So to rewind a little bit to see where we've come from, um, I'm going to embarrass PPK a little bit here, maybe. Um, but this uh, takes me back to when I first started working for the web. It's a particular honor for me to be on stage today. If you're too young or too new to the industry to know, PPK's uh, website was a precursor to uh, Can I Use. He was documenting the inconsistencies in browsers and, and the different support levels. So it was pretty important for us. Like, Can I Use only came in in 2008. So if anyone's done the quick math, that's 15 years ago now. Um, and that means I've been building for the web for over two decades. At this point, in any of the industry polls that we have online, state of HTML, that kind of thing, I just get bucketed into some kind of open-ended entry at the end. Um, and it's a weird flex to kind of point out my own age. Um, but what it means is that I've experienced different eras of building for the web. 
when I first started, we were doing things like this. We weren't debating over whether we should put CSS in JavaScript. We were putting JavaScript in our CSS. Does anyone recognize what this, what this is for? A few hands going up. Yoav, do you want to take this one? So close, but so this is how we actually implemented transparent PNGs before they were uh, existing in Internet Explorer back in the old days. And it wasn't the only thing that we didn't have. Um, there were no evergreen browsers like we have today, where they just constantly update with these new features. Um, so even when new features came out, it was a snail's pace at which they were adopted by uh, our end users. Front-end development wasn't really taken seriously. As you've heard earlier from people like Mark, you know, we had the kind of web designer role who was kind of crossing over between design and development, and they were kind of responsible for both. Or you had back-end developers who also dabbled in the front end, and there was this kind of gap in the middle where it wasn't really just a, an isolated role. Half the web was inaccessible Flash websites. And in terms of automated testing, while Selenium did exist back then, um, it was so resource intensive, so slow, that most people just YOLO'd some jQuery and hit refresh all the time to QA their sites. And finally, unlike today, we only had really rudimentary web performance tooling. There's no such thing as Lighthouse, Core Web Vitals, or web page test. But despite this, it was an incredible platform like it is today. You can reach a global audience. You can iterate faster than any other platform. If anyone's done any native mobile development, it does not compare to building for the web. You can literally go from writing a few lines of code in an IDE, slinging it up on an F SFTP, or you know, pushing that up to GitHub, and it can be in users' hands within seconds. And back then, we had a lower disparity in our devices and our connectivity. Everyone was on crappy uh, dial-up or you know, early broadband. Everyone had these old archaic CRTs and desktop computers. And that meant we were more connected with people experiencing the kind of problems. Nowadays, everyone's got these fancy iPhones or MacBook Pros, and you're kind of disconnected from a lot of your users. Because of this kind of uh, disparity in both the, the kind of connectivity side and um, the, the browsers all supporting different things back then, Two terms, progressive enhancement and graceful degradation, were coined. And that helped us push people to build these more robust websites. And the web standards movement focused on creating more consistency between the browsers. Obviously, things have moved along a lot since then. You know, we've even managed to get border radius native in CSS. If anyone remembers that, we used to cut up bullet points to make the four corners of a square round, which was ridiculous. Um, uh, but kind of despite all of these improvements since then, the web's felt a little like this. We've seen incredible growth in the industry. Front-end development's now taken very seriously, which is great. I mean, we're a subset of you know, front-end here, and you know, we've packed out this hall. Um, but big tech and VC have moved in and, and showed us these kind of very shiny demos that are actually quite shallow. It's like a hello world demo. Look how great this is. But in reality, there's a lot of problems with them. And the pressure on the available talent over the past decade has meant that we've been kind of chasing our tails in terms of everyone wanting to get the best jobs uh, possible, which, you know, I don't blame anyone for, um, and wanting to use the technologies they're excited about. And companies being like, okay, well, we've, we've got to offer that, otherwise we're not going to have any developers left. So that has meant that we've lost sight of our users a little bit. Earlier in the year, I uh, was on Reddit, and I saw someone, it wasn't me, uh, who posted this question, why are you still using React? And they, they you know, were posing that there's a, you know, a plethora of better options these days. You know, why are you still using it in 2023? And the number one voted answer was primarily the money, the, you know, people chasing employment. And I'm not hating on React here, not hating on people just trying to earn a salary. Those are perfectly legitimate reasons. However, that's a far cry from being user-centric. That said, we've been kind of promised that this would trickle down to our end users, right? And it, it kind of makes sense, you know, on paper. You know, if, if we focus on the developer experience, make developers more productive, then that will mean that all the outsourcing of that expertise will mean that users get a better experience. 
and it'll mean that they can focus, they've got more time to focus on enhancing that user experience as well. But if that trickle down had actually worked, we'd have some incredible websites right now. Well, the, the, the whole web would be incredible, rather. But it's not really worked out like that. So this is an, a, another thing that I saw at the, the start of the year, dropped into my inbox. It was a case study, uh, a bit of research done by Storyblock. And they, they found that the resounding majority of businesses felt that their website was actually holding sales back because of poor user experience. 92% is a pretty incredible figure. This both shocked me and didn't surprise me at the same time. And in fact, there was, there was, it, this goes even further. So behind the scenes, there's also 10% of these businesses felt that the, the cost was over £100,000 a year in lost sales. So pretty significant. So I, I said it was shocking, and obviously these numbers kind of stand for themselves, but it wasn't surprising. And that's because the modern web is often broken in very fundamental ways. Whether it's like janky sliders that are like two frames a second as you're trying to swipe on them or they're not locking the scroll direction properly. Whether it's menus that you try and hover over to the item that you want to click on and the menu disappears. Um, a couple of months ago, I was going on holiday, trying to check into a flight. Um, I'm not naming any names. I've tried to cover up who this is. Uh, and I couldn't actually check in because the form wouldn't render. And looking into DevTools, it was because there was a JavaScript error on the site. Annoyingly, I couldn't hack around it because I didn't actually have a clue what the markup needed to be to be able to, to hit that form. And then a couple of weeks later, it may have been on the return journey, actually, um, they had another problem. The form was working, it rendered, but I couldn't submit it. And ironically, it was because their JavaScript library that was collecting errors had an error. Um, so I don't know how they managed to realize and fix that in future. Um, but, you know, in fairness to them, they're not the only one here. Checking into my flight to actually attend this conference, I had exactly the same problem um, with another airline. So we've got to be able to do better than this, right? We need to recognize that a lot of the time when we're being promised a great developer experience, really what we're being sold is just purely convenience. Yes, there's a time for convenience, you know, when you really need to get something done very, very quickly and you're willing to compromise on a lot of factors, but we shouldn't be using that up front. You know, you could do all of your shopping from a local convenience store, for example, but over time that's going to be way more expensive and you can have way fewer options than going to a larger out-of-town supermarket. In terms of development, productivity is more than just being able to NPM install something or copy and paste some third-party script into your site. There's always knock-on effects from this, and performance is often one of the key victims here. I actually messaged Harry Roberts, sat on the front row here, uh, a couple of weeks ago to ask him, you know, how many of your clients actually come to you ahead of time to try and mitigate against any performance trade-offs that they might have to make as they're developing a new project? And somewhat unsurprisingly, as you can see, uh, not many. Most of them come to him when their world is on fire. And these are big brands. They've been promised, ah, oh, it'll be so productive, it'll be incredible performance, costs will be lower. You know, these, these are promises made by outsourced agencies, by their own in-house dev teams from time to time. And it's because nobody really took the time to analyze these projects holistically. They were focusing on, you know, what do they really want to use in terms of the technology. So in my work as a CTO, I've been CTO for, for eight years now, and I've just gone self-employed to do it as a, in a fractional capacity. It's my job to kind of look at the, the whole spectrum of uh, functional and non-functional requirements and kind of manage all of those trade-offs in terms of what's important and what's going to have the impacts. And one thing I can tell you is that when web performance is suffering, it's generally like a code smell for other problems within the organization or the project. We need to strike a balance between all of these different elements, particularly the top six, because they're the ones that really our users see. <clears throat> and I think the trouble is that a lot of the time we don't talk about kind of our failures. So I'm going to kind of fall on my sword a little bit here. Um, I have made this mistake. We focus way too much on the availability of talent and retention of uh, developers. So I'm not innocent at all. A couple of 
years ago now. Um, one of my dev teams came to me, and they wanted to use a new tech stack uh, for the next site that they were working on. Um, everyone at the time, as today, would, wanted to use React. Everyone wants to use whatever Netflix and Facebook are using, because they have you know, those grand ambitions, and there's nothing wrong with that. But few people were talking publicly about when that goes horribly wrong. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're in this kind of cycle of you know, hiring because people have that expertise and they want to work on those things, rather than focusing on what the users want. So the team suggested using Next.js. Um, and naturally, given my background in the kind of web performance space, I was a little bit reserved about just accepting that on face value. But they assured me, obviously, it's got you know, server-side rendering, and you can customize it. So any suggestions I might have, they would be able to implement. And I accepted that decision at the end of the day. I said, OK, um, you know, you've convinced me. Um, and we do need to factor in the fact that everyone wants to be using these tools now. But it was quite costly. And I want to be clear, it wasn't the end of the world. But there's, because of those, those other factors that were at play, um, it did impact us. So this is the site in question in terms of its uh, core web vitals. And as you can see, the team did an incredible job of getting it to pass all three. But with every little change that came, every little optimization uh, that we focused on, it took way longer than expected to implement. Their tools were fighting against them rather than working with the grain of the web. <clears throat> I kid you not, the amount of times that I had to put in a request to even just add some loading feedback. Because by default, they're working on very fast machines, and they can't experience that, that slowness. So everything feels instant to them. But to our real end users, they just didn't, ex you know, they, they didn't have that experience. And these were senior engineers. The project cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. So it wasn't that they were starved of budget. Um, we were obviously having to prioritize performance. You know, it had me literally on their backs if they didn't do it. Um, and obviously, we had the experience and, and the, the expertise. You know, I've, I've learned so much from the various speakers that we've had at Perth now over the years um, and other people in the community. And this is particularly important. You know, if you watched Nishu's talk earlier, you can see how important IMP is going to become. And, you know, we need all those kind of that loading feedback and whatnot. And on that note, I had actually hacked that screenshot. I, I wanted to kind of remove the distraction of IMP failing. But even after all that investment, now the site is back to failing again, well, as of March next year when this, this becomes improper. But ultimately, this is showing what the users are really experiencing. We've got a problem here. We need to solve this today, you know, not in six months' time. So it's really important that we are able to focus on this properly. And obviously, with this, with this project, they had, as I say, investment into it, prioritization, and expertise. I'm sure you can imagine what organizations are facing when they don't have all of those three. You know, we were in a very fortunate position. In fact, I can actually show you with one of my uh, old clients. So in the background of this slide, you'll see three speed curve reports. Um, this is from a project that we built, um, a before and after. Uh, we did the before, uh, just to be clear. Um, this is just a standard kind of server-side rendered. Uh, it was using jQuery. Uh, it was you know, a normal website, really. Um, and when they uh, looked to migrate, their agency uh, was pushing them into using a single-page app. Um, and obviously, you can see it's a sea of red. Um, you know, it, it may have needed a bit of modernization, but the, the site did work back then. Um, and they've taken on this massive project because they were, they were pushed into it. And this seems to be a kind of repeating theme, is that they're not making these decisions based on the end users. So if businesses are often sold these, these dreams in terms of what it's going to be like, it's going to be like an app, it's going to feel amazing, everything's going to feel instant, that's great but it's not really come from user feedback. If anyone's actually looked through customer feedback on a website before, and, and I know that's not an exciting prospect, um, but you know, I'm fun at parties. Um, <laughs> you know, there'll be all manner of weird comments in there, I can assure you, but I wish the website was more app-like will probably not be one of them. You know, if you're listening to the, the, the 
vocal audience on, uh, on social media. They'll make you feel like if you don't have an, you know, an architecture diagram that looks like this, if you've not got 2,000 microservices unified by GraphQL and rendering a componentized design system via serverless edge workers, then you know, you're just not doing it right, are you? But the reality is that all our users really want is a consistently actually working website that's reasonably fast, accessible, and usable. I don't think that's too much to really ask for. I know this can be a little a bit of a hard sell um, versus all the kind of fancy technology, but you know, we should be focusing on you know, these solid foundations rather than trying to deliver an amazing experience for the very small uh, you know, minority of users who managed to dodge all of our bugs, be on the right fastest device at the time, and you know have great connectivity and a full battery? Um, you know we should be we should be focusing on the on the top six here. So I'm going to walk through uh, these different elements and and kind of talk about the different problems. They're all kind of interconnected uh, when we when we utilize JavaScript way too much and re-implement uh, parts of the platform as best we can. Obviously, firstly, we've got to talk about performance. So whether it's you know, the network impact of loading a big network or loading large JavaScript files, you know, things like VDOM diffing, complex DOM updates, you know, missing the GPU compositing, you know, if, we did, if we just implement things in JavaScript rather than using CSS properly. Obviously, there's a plethora of performance problems. I'm sure you've all brought many with you today to try and uh, address. And yes, we have tools like we have compression, we have uh, bundling, we have tree shaking, you know, we have resource hints, speculation rules, all these different things. But they are just that, they're tools. They're not silver bullets, they're, they're patches over problems. You know, a lot of the time, they're treating the symptom rather than the actual problem. And a lot of the time, they actually add to our build processes as well. And that gets more complex and leads me on to my next point, which is, is there's more to maintain. You know, if, you, if you've ever opened a, a JavaScript heavy application that's maybe not been touched for just six months, you know, you're going to have a whole wide array of dependencies that you've got to update before you can even make a minor change to that project. You know, staying on top of, you know, just NPM package updates can be a full-time job in itself. I have actually seen that. Um, don't get me started on people using buttons that are supposed to be links and links that are supposed to be buttons or just div tags for everything. Um, you know, yes, you can do that outside of, you know, JavaScript heavy applications, um, but, you know, it generally happens more so, you know, when it's easy just to hook into any old, old element. <clears throat> In terms of security, two of the most powerful features we have our content security policy and feature policy. Both of these are loaded at document level. So if we have soft navigations, that means that you've got to open those policies to include anything that could be soft navigated to uh, across your site. No longer can you compartmentalize scripts and, and things like that down to a per request or per section or per page uh, format. You have to you know, cast your net wide, and that means that you've got a much greater area uh, of, of attack uh, and when it comes to security. So things like if you've got to do HIPAA audits or you've got PCI compliance if you're in e-commerce, you know, those are going to be a lot more difficult um, because you've, you've, you've been able to, you've, you're not able to target those navigations properly. With soft navigation, you also have to take up the job of re-implementing things like loading spinners, as I've mentioned. You know, even if you use the, the navigation API to update your URLs, you still need to manually manage things like scroll position. And if you've ever seen someone like trying to, to browse, you know, clothing online, for example, you know, you've got this myriad of, of different items on a product listing page, you know, you'll see very quickly people start just opening thousands of tabs because they don't trust the back button working properly, that it'll go to the right position. Uh, my partner's laughing down there because I, I spotted her watch, uh, buying dresses the other day in exactly that way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a massive amount of stress when things don't work quite as they should. And this is, you know, follows on to, to our kind of re reliability and, and the website's actually working properly as well. You know, when you've got hard navigations, the browser's very good at saying, okay, we don't need that content anymore. You know, it can live in the cache, but you know, we, we can actually tear down that old page state. You know, we don't have to worry so much about things like uh, you know, uh, memory issues or getting into a bad state. Like if you have a long enough session on a single page app, 
you're probably going to end up with some weird Redux state at some point, and the website's not going to act as it should. And then on this final point, I've kind of put questions against it, and I've used the whole kind of it depends thing, because everyone's onboarding and training processes are very different. Every project is very different. Um, you know, I don't think there's any kind of standard format where I think Rails has done it best, maybe. But um, generally, when developers join a new uh, company or a new project, it, there's, there's always going to be some training involved. So I suppose that doesn't really matter what technologies you're using. But I could go on. And I think it's pretty clear already that few teams of developers are actually ready for this degree of complexity. You know, I hope your teams are the exception. And the fact that you're all here today, you know, trying to learn more about performance shows that you're cognizant of kind of non-functional requirements and that you want to give the best experience to users. But if you do want to try and improve things, what can you do? And that gets me to the kind of crux of this talk, is that I think we should all be embracing the web platform a lot more. <clears throat> you may not be aware of this, but the actual way that the platform is defined is to make our lives easier. So yesterday, I was sat in a, a Google Summit. Um, in that room, there was maybe 10, 15 browser engineers, people like you have, who are literally there trying to make our lives easier. W3C calls this the priority of constituencies. And as you can see, we're fairly high in the list. We're, we're the authors in this, in this text. Um, only our end users are considered more important than us. Um, so it seems silly to kind of throw away all of that and just go, oh, we'll just do it all ourselves. Um, so I've got an actual real example. And with all of this in mind, I wanted to see how far we could really push the web platform. And I was doing a, a, an e-commerce migration. We're taking an online marketplace uh, platform, moving it to a new one. And this is the kind of before in, uh, in, in speed curve. You can see the LCP is a little off, but it's not terrible. Um, CLS had already been very well optimized. Um, but when it comes to our JavaScripts, we had a lot of problems. That's the, the purple bar in the chart. And, on this screen, you may not be able to see the chart, but that's 12 seconds is the uh, time to interactive, which I know isn't the perfect metric, but that's pretty awful, right? 12 seconds is a long time. So obviously, we wanted to address this, but it's not the, the, the only problem we had with JavaScript. There's a few bits that SpeedCurve didn't show. I looked into GitHub, and there were 55,000 lines of JavaScript for this website. And yes, that was the source code, but 55,000 lines, even being pushed through a build pipeline is not going to output nothing. Um, you know, there was a, a clear problem with the productivity here as well. So something had to be done. And today, I want to show you five web platform APIs um, that really got me excited about working with the web again. These are things that we used on this website um, that you should be able to use today. Um, and hopefully, it'll get you pumped for using the web platform. These are things that have shown me you know, we can learn from the past. We can use the good and the bad um, and, and produce a site that is more productive for us, better for our end users, faster, more accessible, so everyone wins. So before I actually go into those APIs, I know that was a bit of a tease, um, I need to show you the, the kind of approach we took, because they all have varying degrees of browser support and varying degrees of demand on JavaScript. So. The first thing I need to mention is progressive enhancement. We've kind of covered this a little bit with um, the island architecture uh, coverage from Mark earlier, uh, which is a great example of progressive enhancement. Send as much HTML down as you can. But some people feel that this means kind of re-implementing your website twice. You know, you've got to show the, make sure that the HTML-only version works, and then you know, make sure that when JavaScript comes, then we've got to check that as well. But it's, it's really not that hard. <laughs> It just requires some education and, and true empathy, which I appreciate is, is effort as well. So just for the avoidance of doubt, it's about sending real HTML forms, links, buttons that work as they should. It's about accepting that there will be bugs in your software. You know, I advise my clients, I say, look, you know, we've all experienced problems. Whether you're technical or non-technical, everyone has experienced problems in software. So we would be naive to think that Every project is going to be perfect. There's going to be no bugs. So as long as the cost isn't too high, why don't we just accept that and prepare for it? We don't have to 
make sure everything works without JavaScript, just like our core functionality. So things like checking into my flights should be possible. Um, we don't have to go cold turkey on our frameworks and libraries. You can still use them, but try and use things that you know, are aligned with the web rather than you know, not really working for it. Secondly, browser support. If I go, go back in time again, this is when I was at university, and you can see how slowly web browsers were releasing updates. Again, there might have been a few, you know, this might have been around the time of the evergreen thing coming in with Chrome, but um, you know, it was still very slow. This is today. Things move a lot, a lot quicker. So it's really important that you pay attention uh, to how features are getting adopted. You don't have to wait for every single browser on the, the planet to support a feature. You don't have to wait for all of your user base to update to gain access to that feature. So developing against the lowest con con uh, common denominator um, doesn't mean that you're, uh, you you'll effectively sacrifice um, all the goodness that we can bring with these APIs that are designed to be more powerful, more performant. So if we can target at significant portions of our user base. It might be Chrome only, and that might be, say, 40% of your traffic, but that's a huge chunk of people. Um, so that's what we should be aiming to do. And then, of course, if we can target the rest of everyone using polyfills or shims or alternative code paths, um, then that's great too. You know, we can target as many people as possible. Obviously, we want to use the, the kind of platform native optimized versions, um, but this will fill the gap until then. So, again, this doesn't mean making it work for absolutely everyone, especially re regardless of performance impact. Some polyfills are quite significant in size. You know, we don't need to polyfill necessarily back to the Stone Age. Some will assume that you want IE8 support, but you don't actually need that anymore. So consider what a polyfill is doing. Similarly, you might only be using one API and not 20. Um, so for the sake of one line of code, if you can get away with like an if-else and just do a different code path, that may be way more optimal. It means that your JavaScript is going to be a lot smaller and you're not maintaining another polyfill. Obviously, we try and load polyfills as optimally as possible in terms of detecting that browser support and only loading it if needed. But that's not always possible, so always make sure you're reviewing this on a regular basis as to what you still need to have in there. And again, this is about giving as many people in your customer base the best experience as possible. So, I don't have a wonderful ton of time, but I'm going to crack on as quickly as possible. So, back to those APIs. The first one that I want to mention is import maps. These had a lot of noise about them a couple of years ago, but then it kind of went quiet. Apparently, I checked this earlier, less than 1% of websites actually use these, but they're really powerful. And thankfully, Safari added support earlier this year in March uh, in version 16.4, so you can now use it completely across all major browsers, and you can shim it for Safari if needed. So what does it do? Well, it effectively gives you a little blob of JSON that's a mapping between a file name and where to load it. It's as simple as that, really. Um, you can see a couple of examples here. You drop this into your HTML, and then when you're doing an import just like this, it will actually transform that on the fly for you and load it from wherever that file actually exists. <clears throat> So <laughs> I suppose this is one little note. You can load them <laughs> from third-party sites. Please don't do this. Bundle everything into your kind of first-party site and ser serve it from there. Um, but effectively, what this gives us is a uh, better control over our caching and maybe a lower need to uh, depend on bundling. So typically, without this feature, if you had a shared library that's you know, in, used by three different files, obviously, you could just load it on the fly. But if you wanted to kind of bundle this together, Harry's doing a talk on caching tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into this too much. But effectively, you want to fingerprint all of those files. You're going to have a version number or a hash of the contents. Um, and of course, you know, if you update your shared library to version 2, that means that all of the imports need to be updated to version 2, which then means that all of those files need to be updated to version 2. And suddenly, you've just wiped out the entire cache of your site because one library changed. So with import maps, we can get an improved cache ratio because we're not you know, wiping out the entire cache in one go. You can have far more simple build pipelines, faster to get code out into production. There's a lower reliance on bundling. It, you know, it can still be needed depending on how much JavaScript you're serving. And Pat's going to be doing a talk tomorrow on shared compression dictionaries, which do help with this problem. Um, and 
one of the great things that you get with this is better control over prioritization. Because as soon as you bundle all your scripts together in one file, or in a you know, couple of files, those files can only be you know, loaded at one time. And um, effectively, you have to serve that in the highest priority of any item within that bundle. So you may have something that's, say, powering a burger menu. That's pretty important to become interactive as soon as humanly possible. If you bundle that with a load of less lower priority features, then you're suddenly loading a whole bunch of JavaScript way earlier than you needed to. Whereas if you have these individual files, you can load them as and when they're needed. You know, you'll, you, you'll load a tiny little bit for your uh, burger menu, and then you'll load the other features uh, further down the waterfall. So ultimately, this is what your kind of build process output can be. It can be this simple, one little mapping and loading a couple of scripts. And the great thing is you have full control over just you know, outputting these scripts as you want. You know, if you're using you know, any kind of server-side uh, rendering, generally you can control just you know, the output of these tags. You don't have to worry about the kind of masking between you know, what you want out from Webpack and what it actually just spits out. The second architectural decision we made was to use custom elements. Um, it's one of my favorite features. They're really well supported now. Um, the the uh, adoption of them is rising massively. I think a lot of third parties have started using them, so it's a little bit muddy. Um, but I definitely recommend using them. A lot of people get scared off, and I hesitated to mention web components specifically because everyone hears about the Shadow DOM, and it's very scary. Um, and there's terminology like the declarative Shadow DOM and other things. Um, so you probably don't need that. Uh, most people don't actually need the Shadow DOM. It's a great way to encapsulate if you want you know, your CSS styling, for example, not to bleed in, you know, to, to reference external styles um, that, you know, uh, part of the rest of your page. You know, that can be useful, um, but nine out of 10 times, you just don't need it. So with the light DOM, the DOM we're all used to, you can just simply wrap your uh, custom element around any other elements, or it might just be its own standalone element. It looks just like this. One thing to note is that they have to have a hyphen in them just to differentiate them between the native elements. Um, if anyone's used like old school class components in React, this looks probably very similar to you, and that's one of the beauties of how they work. Um, you don't have to worry about when a DOM node gets added or when it gets removed. The, the native API will manage all of that for you. All you've got to do is fill out these two methods. So when they get added to the DOM, the connected callback occurs. When they get removed, it gets called disconnected. Simple as that. So you can attach events in here, do whatever you need to do to initialize them. <clears throat> Just like React, you can respond to attribute changes, which is great. You know, simple API again. You just literally give it an array of attributes you want to respond to. If those get changed at all, then it's going to call that callback. <clears throat> you can actually make custom elements act like form elements. Again, very simple API. And one of the benefits here is that they'll get serialized just along any other checkboxes or input fields. Um, and you can even participate in the native validation process as well. So it takes a little bit more code than this, but it's very easy to do. And in terms of our kind of progressive enhancement, there's a CSS kind of pseudo selector, um, I don't know exactly the terminology for that is, um, called defines, which allows you to style differently when an element has uh, been connected uh, versus one that's just you know, come down in the HTML. So you can prepare, you know, if maybe avoiding CLS problems, for example, you can you know, prepare your aspect ratio and, and you know, hold that space. Or it may be that you can actually get away with fully rendering all of your styles and then only changing some small parts when that's been connected. So if you've got, like a, for example, a button that activates with the JavaScript, you might want to hide those buttons before um, the element has been defined. So just to kind of summarize them, don't overcomplicate them. You probably don't need to use slots or the declarative DOM, uh, declarative shadow DOM. Your custom element can just use query selector internally to reference its internal uh, nodes and in a HTML to modify things. <coughs> you probably don't need isometric, uh, isomorphic rendering. I know everyone's kind of used to the JSX thing now where it's like, you can just write one component and it gets rendered in both places. But a little bit of duplication isn't a major problem. Um, we've got some examples uh, in a second that I'll show you where we rendered one thing in Liquid and then we had uh, some um, JavaScript to kind of enhance that. Um, 
it's, it's probably fine. I think we're all a little too afraid of any duplication at all. Things can be too dry. Um, so, and if you do need that, then there are some alternatives. You can use libraries like Lit or WebC or Enhance. Uh, some great options there for you. So, my first visual feature for you is scroll snapping, scroll linked animations. These are really exciting to me. So for years, we've had the kind of swiping on mobile, and I mentioned like janky, the you know, JavaScript, the way you're kind of swiping across and it's like jittery. Um, you can implement this just in 10 lines of CSS now. So progressive enhancement, so it'll just be a scrollable area, uh, you know, if the browser doesn't support it, but browser support is fantastic on this feature. Zero JavaScript required, and it's GPU accelerated, so you don't even need to worry about uh, getting any more advanced than this. Don't worry about this CSS. This is just to show you how to implement it. All the slides are at that link just in the corner there, and there's a QR code at the end for you. Um, but effectively, this is just to show how simple this really is. Um, the only trouble is that this pattern doesn't work so well on tablet and desktop where it just looks like an element's been kind of cut off if you're using the kind of card style. So I wanted to introduce these, you might see these little shadows on either side, um, just to give that bit of affordance that there's something underneath. Um, so that's where uh, scroll linked animation comes in. And again, it's a progressive enhancement. I did have the slide just saying that WebKit are viewing this as something that they're supportive of. Um, but literally, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I had to update this slide because they've just merged in the tests to support building this feature in, uh, which suggests that it is imminent now in, uh, in Safari. So again, progressive enhancement, few lines of CSS, no JavaScript necessary, though there is a JavaScript API if you do want to use it. Um, and we can polyfill it just using an insert section observer. Here's another example of uh, how you can use it. I've got these little indicators beneath each product, and you can kind of swipe left and right. So we wanted to see, show someone that there is two images. Um, so it's a nice little use case for it. Again, very simple amount of CSS to do this uh, using the, the keyframe API. Uh, this has moved on since I actually created this slide. You might want to use animation range rather than using 1% to animate on. Um, but you can see how simple this is. I think there's two new uh, CSS, CSS attributes here. And when it comes to our custom elements, these are a great way to polyfill in support. Um, we can just effectively leave them as undefined uh, components for the browsers that do support these features. Uh, we don't need that intersection observer in those instances. So we might just use like display contents in CSS for the undefined version. That way they're effectively invisible. Um, and it just you know renders as if the children are part of the, the parent node. Um, and then yeah, we just enhance that to, to say, okay, well, these are browsers that don't support um, scroll linked animation, and the, the latter is for only for those larger devices uh, where they're on tablet and upwards. <clears throat> My second visual feature is view transitions. Um, so I think a lot of people use single page apps because they like the, 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 the visual nature of these page transitions. It feels more fluid, and it's a massive trade off. You know, we, we kind of fight this problem. Uh, quite often, um, you know, all of the reasons I mentioned earlier um, are, you know, are problematic with single page apps. But no one likes having their toys taken away from them, and I kind of get that, uh, which is where this, this API comes in. So there's kind of two variations of it. Uh, you can do cross-document uh, transitions or MPA uh, transitions. This, we don't know what Safari or WebKit are thinking about. Um, I think there were some problems as to, you know, um, some kind of concerns as to how it needs to work. Um, you do have to delay certain things um, from rendering in order to get that kind of smooth render between the two. But you can enable this with just one line of, of HTML. Zero JavaScript required, and again, GPU accelerated, so you don't need to worry about the performance of it. It's literally this one line, a meta tag that you put in the, in the head. Um, if you want to get a, a uh, kind of style as per the, the previous demo, you need to tag your elements as to which ones you want to transition, otherwise it'll just do a fade between the pages. And you can customize those animations again, just using the keywords, uh, keyframes attribute in CSS as we're all used to. Um, this is a slightly different implementation uh, where it's an on-page uh, transition. Um, so this is someone filtering around. I'm not a fan of this, this animation really, but it's a good way to kind of illustrate it. And this is the single document version of this API. So this is more called the kind of SPA style, 
again, progressive enhancement. It does require JavaScript because it is on page. Um, and ultimately, if you're going to be you know, fetching some content to load in, you're going to need JavaScript for that anyway. Um, but you can customize it in just the same way with CSS. And again, you get that GPU acceleration. The API is really straightforward. You basically have this one line. This includes the fallback, so you know it's very straightforward. But this one line at the bottom, start view transition, and you give it a callback. It'll effectively take some screenshots of before, do whatever updates you tell it to, and then animate those screenshots for you. So very straightforward. And you can actually somewhat patch this in to uh, the browser itself for, the, for uh, additional support by using the navigation API. Um, so Again, it's not supported in WebKit or, or Firefox at this uh, stage. However, both have indicated that they're very positive about implementing it, and I've been kind of fighting that fight for a while. Um, so you may have all heard of the History API. It's how a lot of single-page apps works today. Um, but there's a lot of trade-offs with this. You've got to manually attach loads of DOM event handlers you know, to click and submit events. Um, you've got to implement loading feedback, as I mentioned earlier. You've got to make sure you've got spinners or loading states somehow. Um, you've got to implement uh, an announcements of page changes to accessibility tools, and you've got to manage that scroll position all yourself. Whereas if we use the navigation API, you have one event to listen on. It's a global event, effectively, for any navigation. Um, you can decide whether you want to intercept it or not. Um, things like the, the can intercept here uh, thing is just for, for refreshes and things like that. Um, but you can have some conditional logic on there. You might only want to intercept certain URLs. Um, and then again, you just you call it event.intercept, give it a callback. During that time, when that callback is, the callback is uh, running, the browser will show its native loading state. So you'll get the little spinner. Um, the user will actually see something. You don't, you, know, you don't have to show something on the screen, although I'd still recommend doing that. Um, you can go away, make a fetch call, whatever it might be, and then render that content back to the screen. And after that point, it will assume that it's done. So this is how you can patch in that view transition. Quite straightforward, right? Just literally that one line. Um, and you can kind of get that single page app style behavior, but just using these very native APIs. So the great thing here is that it's decoupled from the DOM, get that native browser loading states. You don't have to worry about accessibility tools because it manages that for you. And it handles restoring the scroll position for you. There's various different options for it, but it will do that for you with just one line. I'm running out of time. I'm actually on negative time now. Uh, so <laughs> I've just got a couple more minutes. Um, I've got a couple of bo bonus noteworthy mentions, things that I don't have time to go into detail on, um, but they're very straightforward and are great uses of the platform. So we use the dialog element for a kind of light box zoomed in uh, 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 view of the, of the product images. Um, it doesn't show the zoom bit here, but you can kind of see how it pops out. Um, we use the details elements uh, for a kind of accordion uh, view of the, all the details on the product page. And then we used uh, CSS-based toggles and then enhanced them with JavaScript to provide some extra accessibility um, for the burger menu and the, uh, the basket. And that meant that you know, even without JavaScript, this would still work. It wouldn't be accessible as such, but at least we're getting that, you know, that interaction works immediately as soon as that web page loads. There are a whole bunch, we didn't use all of these, but there are a whole bunch of really, really exciting things happening on the web platform. Um, I encourage you to check out all of these different features. Just understand what they are. You don't need to understand how really they work or you know, all the kind of syntax behind them. Um, but you know, next time you're implementing something, you know, it might be like, oh yeah, actually I can just do this uh, natively. Um, so I suppose the, the kind of main takeaway here is use the platform, don't re-implement it. But you might have noticed I've kind of missed out on going back to those stats. Um, so I'll just quickly cover those off. We took 55,000 lines of JavaScript down to just 650. Uh, <laughs> and I'll refresh you on what Speaker View used to look like. And bear in mind the, the scale on these charts will change because it will look like things got a lot worse, but actually they did get better. This is the after. Um, you can see that. Um, we no longer have problems with JavaScript. Um, I know this isn't IMP, but you know it's the closest proxy we had at the time. Um, and as I say, the scale of the chart did change to three seconds from 12. So while the purple bar didn't change on there and all the other bars got a lot worse, actually, <laughs> relatively, it is better. 
Um, so if you want to be successful working with the web platform, really understand your audience. They, they may be using different browsers to, you ex to what you expect, different devices, and obviously different performance constraints. Don't limit yourself just to really well uh, uh, adopted features. Sorry. Um, consider the standards positions of the browsers. You, know, you can see what they're thinking. There's, there's various different GitHub repos for that. Consider the, the, the maturity of these standards. You know, if you're going to adopt something early on, um, you know, is it going to change significantly? And if it does, how much of a problem is that going to be for you? Is it very low risk to implement? If not, why not go ahead for it? Um, and then consider how far back and how wide these polyfills need to be. Um, and hopefully that will mean that you can give people a really great experience to, you know, say the majority of your customer base and not impact performance too much. Thank you for your time. Um, that's, that's all I've got for you. Ryan, come on over. Come on over and perch here with me. Um, I, I'm trying not to get emotional about the number of times you used the word progressive enhancement. I'm so happy, <laughs> so happy to hear that phrase. Uh, it feels like it's such an important thing. Um, I've, I've been told I'm, I'm, I'm only allowed to ask one question because okay. it was more important that we heard the content rather than hear me waffle on. So I, I would like to talk about lots of different things, but I'm just purely going to call out the number of exciting web APIs you, you, you mentioned there. There's, it feels like we're getting access to an incredible toolbox and it's replacing so many I don't know, less round, uh, more roundabout, more convoluted way of, of getting access to, to some of these, these uh, experiences. Um, so I guess maybe just the one question I'd ask is about discovering those. You know, how do you find out about the new or, uh, or the upcoming web APIs and how do you start learning about them? That's maybe the, the one thing we should ask. Yeah, so I mentioned the standards positions um, of each of the browsers. Um, they are open source GitHub repos, so you can just search for like WebKit standards positions um, or, or Firefox, or I don't know whether it's under Gecko, but, um, but yeah, so each browser's got a, a repo where they, they open issues on those, and you can obviously search through them and follow those repos. Um, Web.dev do a, a great monthly roundup of new features to the web platform API, so definitely subscribe to that. And there's also the interop movement, who every year focus on a collection of uh, different features and try and bring it to every uh, browser. So again, they've got a, I think they've got a GitHub repo and there's a, a website for that as well. So just give it a little Google. Excellent. And I recommend that people also, I see you've got the slides up there uh, and a QR code uh, to them as well. So people can get a bunch of resources from there. Um, I'd love to chat more, uh, but will you be available for people to yeah, talk yeah, to? Up the speaker to Excellent. So uh, don't forget to check out uh, the speaker table where you'll be able to find, find several of our speakers, uh, including Ryan. So for now, uh, join me in uh, showing your thanks to the wonderful Ryan Townsend. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.